ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا طبتم وطاب ممشاكم وتبوأت من الجنة منزلا نسأل الله جل جلاله أن يجمعنا في الفردوس الأعلى مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن أولئك رفيقا كما جمعنا على طاعته في هذه الدنيا إنه ولي ذلك والقادر عليه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We are all praises due to Allah and peace and blessings be upon his messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم <clears throat> and we are going to continue inshallah ta'ala our talk about Uthman radiallahu anhu and then we will move on to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu who remembers where did we leave, leave off last week to see who was following and who was not and who was and who wasn't ah. you guys have an idea inshallah all right we were talking about Uthman radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. And we talked about some of his characteristics. And maybe I want to um, sum some of these things up again because we can't talk enough about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And as we mentioned, I don't want to say we are doing a great disservice or injustice by not speaking about them, especially the four khulafa, in greater detail, um, is just due to the lack of time. But we are trying to see if we can benefit, inshallah ta'ala, from these great figures of Islam, these pillars of Islam. These are the ones, after the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His mercy, were the ones who carried on the torch of Islam that each one of us carries today or has today. And we are all, without an exception, in all the deeds that we do as Muslims, we are all in the mizan or the balance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then the companions and so forth and so on. So imagine how many hasanat do the Sahaba have on their scale and in their balance and on their side and in their bank account, their Jannah bank account, not Wells Fargo huh? or U.S. Bank. Allahu Musta'an. And if we can learn a lesson from this Ikhwati Fillah, because like I said, the goal is to learn from these stories and try to implement some of these things in our lives if we can as difficult as some of the stuff may sound to us. In one of our mashayikh, Hafizahullah said, when we talk about the Sahaba, for instance, when we talk about Uthman radiallahu anhu, that he prayed with the entire Qur'an in one rak'ah. The entire Qur'an, he recited it in one rak'ah. He said some of the people have gotten to the point that it's already a done deal that they don't believe that they could ever do this. This is a done deal. They've already said, I could never do this. And when you talk to some people about what the Sahaba did, or maybe some of the pious, you hear them saying, I could never do that. Of course you can't. Because you don't think you can, خلاص, you'll, you never will. But he said the issue is not this. He said the issue is that we started to have a challenge believing that they did it, or they were capable of doing it. This is a big problem. This shows how far down and how deep we are in the hole that we don't believe when somebody says there is a sun at the top of the hole. You just believe it's dark. So having said that, we want to talk a little bit about Haya'u Uthman, his if we want to use the word shyness, or his respect, his softness, radiallahu anhu. 
and I believe we mentioned this, but we will mention it again, inshallah ta'ala, that one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was laying down, and part of his thigh was shown, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his house. And Abu Bakr asked to come in, asked permission to come in and speak to the Prophet sallallahu and he came in and he spoke to the Prophet sallallahu Then Umar came after that. And then when Uthman came and he asked to come in, the Prophet Sallallahu sat up and he covered his thigh. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he when Uthman left Radiallahu Anhu Jamian, Aisha Radiallahu Anha, she noticed this, she said, Ya Rasulullah, when Abu Bakr Radiallahu Anha came in, and Umar came in, you did not cover your thigh or you did not sit up. But when Uthman asked to come in, you adjusted yourself and you covered your thigh. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Uthman, a rajulun hayi. He has a great shyness. In this shyness, if anybody maybe find, has a better word in English, it's not the shyness that he's not going to get up and say the truth or he's tip, timid maybe is the word we, we're looking for. Allahu a'lam. But he has this Shyness to him that he said, even the malaika tastahi min Uthman. Ala, and then he told Aisha, Ala astahi min rajulin tastahi minhu al malaika. Allah. The Prophet has said, How is it that I can't respect and have a haya myself, a shyness towards Uthman, the man whom the malaika have a shyness towards? In respect. Radiallahu anhu. Uthman one day, the Prophet ﷺ walked in and we said that Uthman was married both daughters of the Prophet, two daughters of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ walked in one day and he saw that his daughter was washing Uthman. What did he say? Oh my daughter, take good care of Uthman that he is the closest one from amongst my Sahaba when it comes to manners and mannerisms. He is the closest one from amongst my Sahaba. Tashabbuhanbi. Meaning he has very close and similar manners and akhlaq that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has. Today, the daughter has a little fight with uh, her husband and she goes to her parents' house and the father says, where is the guy? Let me speak to him. I'll show you what I'll do to him. Allah al -musta'an. If you were looking for the man, a good man in the first place, you should have never married your daughter. Second of all, if you knew you gave her to a man, you should send her back to her husband and tell her to not create any fitna in your household. Huh? Allah al -musta'an. <laughs> We're talking about Uthman radiallahu anhu, right? طيب. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ يَبْغَضُ عُثْمَانِ أَوْ يُبْغِضُ عُثْمَانِ أَبْغَضَهُ اللَّهِ Whomsoever hates or detests Uthman, Allah will hate him or detest him. SubhanAllah. And we talked about how the Prophet ﷺ made many du'as for Uthman. And one of his du'as was, Allahumma arda an Uthman. Allahumma, may, O Allah, be pleased with Uthman. In another du'a he said, O Allah, Uthman is asking for your pleasure, is seeking your pleasure. Innahu yataraddaq. Meaning Uthman is asking that Allah be pleased with him and that Allah be happy with him. O Allah, be pleased with him. This is a du'a straight from the Prophet we cannot fable, imagine, understand the greatness of these people and of the Sahaba and especially those who were close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the highest ranks that they have, not only amongst the entire of humanity, the best people without a doubt after the Prophets are the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhu. None of the Sahaba of the other Prophets, none of the Sahaba of the other 
or the good doers of any of the times. Bear none. The Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam afdalu khalqillah ba'd al-anbiya. Radiyallahu anhum wa ardahum. We will talk about uh, what I want to say when we talk about Ali radiallahu anhu next. Hmm? Subhanallah. So these are some of the things that we, I believe we mentioned about uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu. Listen to this. Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, from the day that I gave allegiance to the Prophet sallallahu I gave him bay'ah. He gave him allegiance to do what? Hmm. Indivisible in peace, <laughs> huh? Under one nation, under God. Is that the is that the pledge that he gave? Huh? One nation under God. They do everything that God doesn't like. Now they want you to vote yes or no or whatever it is. Now it's a confusion. Yes means no, and no means yes. Now, Allahu Musta'an. I'll drink my coffee, inshallah. Tayyib. Uthman radiallahu anhu, he said, مَا لَمَسْتُ ذَكَرِي بِيَدِ الْيُمْنَى مِنْ يَوْمِ بَيَعْتُ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ He said, I did not touch my private parts or his manhood from the day, with my right hand, from the day that I gave allegiance to the Prophet sallallahu Radiallahu anha, he said, Radiallahu anha, he said that he never committed zina even in the jahiliyyah. وَلَا وَضَعْتُ يَدِي الْيُمْنَى عَلَى فَرْجِ مُنْذُ بَيَعْتُ النَّبِيَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَلَّمْ وَمَا مَرَّتْ بِيَا جُمْعَ إِلَّا أَعْتِقُ فِيهَا رَقَبًا And he said, I have not had a Friday pass without me freeing a slave for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we talked about Uthman was extremely, extremely wealthy. رضي الله عنه. He said, وَلَا زَنَيْتُ فِي جَاهِلِيَةِ وَلَا فِي إِسْلَامِ وَلَا سَرَقْتُ قَدْ I did not commit fornication or zina before Islam nor in Islam. رضي الله عنه. And Uthman came one day and some of the Sahaba were getting together or gathered. And he said, he walked in and he said, I did so and so with the Prophet Sallallahu Do you guys bear witness? And we talked about the, the well that Uthman, he bought for the Muslims. We talked about that, right? Nah. And, and he said, I bear witness in front of you that I bought the well of Roma for the Muslims. Do you bear witness? Ali was amongst these people, radiallahu anhum jami'an, he said, Nushhidu, nushhidu lak. Then he said, Jahastu jaysh al-usra, that I set up or prepared or helped with the um, building or pay, uh, getting ready for the soldiers of the Jaysh al-Usra. And was, this was a battle at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu And we talked about how Uthman came and he put a whole sack of money and he dumped it in the lap of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it was full of money. Radiallahu anhu. Subhanallah. And then he walked in and he said, I did so and so, do you bear witness? I did such and such, do you bear witness? to the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum jami'an. And he said, then he came and he said, Allahumma ashhad, Allahumma ashhad. Then he came, at the end he said, O oh Allah, bear witness, O oh Allah, bear witness. And then he left, radiallahu anhum. And some of you might think, why would he mention these things in front of the people? Because Uthman had a hard time with some of the Muslims that wanted to kill him or thought he was unjust. So he mentioned these things and as we go through the story of his Khilafah and how he became a Khalifa and he was the third Khalifa, radiallahu anhu, 
And this was after the death of Umar radiallahu an. And then he said, Uthman radiallahu an on that day when they wanted to make him a khilafah, he said, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ In his khutbah, and we mentioned this, he said, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بَعَثَ مُحَمَّدًا بِالْحَقِّ فَكُنْتُ مِمَّنْ اسْتَجَابَ لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَهَاجَرْتُ الْهِجْرَتَيْنِ وَبَايَعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَمَا غَشَشْتُهُ قَطْ وَلَا عَصَيْتُهُ حَتَّى تَوَفَّاهُ اللَّهِ And then he said, ثُمَّ أَبَا بَكَرْ مِثْلَهِ ثُمَّ عُمَرَ كَذَلِكْ ثُمَّ اسْتُخْلِفْتُ أَفَلَيْسَ لِيَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي لَهُ And we mentioned this last time as well. So Uthman رضي الله عنه, he said when they wanted to vote him as a khalifa, He said, I was one of the first people who gave allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I was the first of the people who made the two hijras. The first hijra was to where? Al-Habacha. And the second hijra was? al Madina. And I was the first to do both. And then he said, when I pledged allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I never did anything that would contradict this allegiance. I did not do anything ill or think of anything ill or try to do anything ill to the Prophet. And then he said, and I never disobeyed him. SubhanAllah, can you imagine someone saying, I never disobeyed the Prophet Sallallahu Seriously, think about this. When you hear this, what, what are your thoughts? You're thinking, he never disobeyed the Prophet Sallallahu Yeah, me too. Is that what you say? <laughs> Seriously, do you kind of say, yeah, me too. Can you say that? Can I say that? Can any of us say that? It's a very strong word. Subhanallah. وَلَا عَصَيْتُهُ حَتَّى لَقِيَ اللَّهِ أَوْ تَوَفَّهُ اللَّهِ I never disobeyed him till the day he died. And I never disobeyed whom? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And Umar after that. So then he's, he's saying these things to let the people know because this was the khutbah that he made when they voted him in as a khalifa. And the vote in Islam is not like the vote in, in non-Islam. But we're not going to get into the detail of that. Because we all want you to vote in November, inshallah. <laughs> vote for Pepsi or Coca-Cola. You're going to die either way, but vote for Pepsi or Coca-Cola. You are free to choose. So... In the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, there were a lot of bounties and a lot of khayr that came to the ummah in the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu. In many of the countries were open or became Muslim in the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu. In a lot of the, 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 uh, the countries of Ifriqiya, for instance, the countries of the northern African peninsula. Um, they became Muslim at the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu. You know, us people, we come from northern Africa, alhamdulillah. Huh? Who can tell us one of the greatest things that Uthman did that every single Muslim knows or should know, I should say? Who can remember? I'll let you guys think about that. It's a pop quiz. Even the sisters, they can help us out with this, inshallah. After all these good things that happened in the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, there was a great fitna that led to his death and to him being killed radiallahu anhu. And before the fitna, we want to talk about this great endeavor 
that occurred at the time of Uthman under his Khilafah, under his supervision, under his authority, under his command radiallahu anhu. What is the Mus'haf called? Hmm? Al-Mus'haf al-Uthmani. Ahsant. The writing of the Mus'haf, the original is called? It's in the Khat al-Uthmani. It's in the right, writing of al-Uthmani. Nisbatan li Uthman. Because in the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, and right after, at the end of the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu anhu, there were so many countries that became Muslim at that time from all over the place. And different Sahabas moved throughout the world and they all had different scriptures of the Quran. When I say different scriptures, so that you, you're going to hear about this and people might ask you who are somewhat educated and want to debate you, they are going to talk about this. And you might have heard it from some of the Christians. Well, how do you guys have the Qur'an and Uthman? He burnt all of the Qur'ans. You've heard, anybody hear that argument? Naam. Uthman radiallahu anhu first wrote the Qur'an in, in, one, in, in, in one type of writing. And, the, and the, the Qur'an itself was memorized in the hearts of the Sahaba. So even today, if we burnt all the masahif, we can write it the next day and, and no problem, inshallah, because we have millions of people who memorize the Qur'an. There's over five million in Pakistan and they don't even know what it means. Allahu Akbar. Oh How many in Somalia? Tell me, you guys. MashaAllah, maybe seven million or ten million. Allahu Akbar. Allah yahfaz ahl al-Somali, inshallah. May Allah protect the people of Somalia, wallahi. They've done a great service to Islam in this country. Jazahumullahu khayyam. Tayyib. Long story short, they came to Uthman radiallahu anhu and they said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, now the people are starting to fight over which um, syllable do they recite in the Quran when they're making the salat. Because some have learned it under this syllable. For instance, there is a different qira'as in the Quran. We've all heard of this. There's qira'at hafs, qira'at warsh, qira'at kada. All of these qira'as have different pronunciations. So when people were making these pronunciations, sometimes the word means a different meaning. And if we start talking, about this in Arabic, not to get into the details of it. Meaning this enriches the meaning of the Quran. The one word can be written. It's written the same, but can be read in two different ways. For instance, In both of these, the way they are written can give us two different meanings. This does not mean one of them is right, one of them is wrong. This means that both of them are right. This is of the strength of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the beauty and the glory of the Quran. So, but the Muslims, not all of them knew that because this knowledge was all accumulated afterwards and it became a science. The knowledge of Quran. And so Uthman radiallahu anhi had a couple of Sahaba write the entire Quran the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had read it to them or they read it with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the end of his before he passed on Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they said that this Quran was the final the final Quran with, that has not been Meaning has not been abrogated, has not been um, changed as far as because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send an ayah, then he would change it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that we can abrogate an ayah or we would make it forgotten. Meaning there were some ayahs that were taken out of the Quran and Allah exchanged them with other ayahs. 
So these, we would not know which ones they are if we start looking at the Qur'an from the beginning of its time until the end of the, Prophet, the death of the Prophet So Zayd ibn Harith had the final recitation with the Prophet and he had the final Qur'an and he was the one who was memorized. Memorized, one of the ones who Abu Bakr told him to accumulate the Qur'an in his time. And then Umar did the same thing. And then Uthman he did the same thing and he said to burn all of the different masahif that are all over the different countries. And we have one Qur'an that everybody will utilize. And he said if the Muslims have any kind of a challenge with how the word should be written, go back to the language of Quraysh because Allah sent it in the language of Quraysh. Now imagine every time every single one of you opens that Quran and reads one syllable of it, who's getting a hasana? Radiallahu anhu arda. Subhanallah. Now, so going back to the fitna, inshallah. And this fitna started, of course, once we get into a society that has a lot of people that came into Islam that are new to Islam, first of all, they don't know ahkam al-Islam. They don't know the laws of Islam. Even though they tried to learn them, a lot of them were not even Arabic speaking. So it took a lot of time for them to get to understand. So they were easy to manipulate. A lot of them did not know the greatness of the Sahaba because they came from different countries, even if they were Arabic speaking. So they did not have this respect that they should have. So when this fitna started, some people, what happened is, One of the um, La ilaha wa muhammad rasulullah. One of the um, assistants, that's the word I'm looking for, of Uthman radiallahu anhu was caught on his way to Egypt with a book or with a letter. Yeah, letter. Yeah, letter. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it's, not a it's not a book, book, but a, a letter if you want to call it a letter. And when he was on his way there, some people, of course, who instigated the letter, who had the stamp of the Khalifa on it, when it has the stamp of the Khalifa, what does it mean? That Uthman radiallahu was the one who did it. Forged signatures. Huh? Yeah, it's been going on for thousands of years. Huh? Do you know why people do the same things they did, the other people did a thousand years ago? Who, t who knows? Because why? It works. It works. It works, but then no, this, the, the teacher is one. They all had the same teacher. Iblis la'anullah. Shaitan is their teacher. He taught all of them the same things. <laughs> they know the same things. Subhanallah. So, when they looked at this book or they looked at this letter and they found some things that, was, that were displeasing to the people of Misr, Egypt, Masr. So they got very angry with him and they wanted to come and they started to protest. You know, just like the Arabs are protesting over there in the Middle East right now. <laughs> no, we've always been protesting, but not for the right things. So, they told Uthman, why don't you come out to us? We want you to be removed from the Khilafah. In a nutshell of the story, so we can conclude inshallah ta'ala. That Uthman radiallahu anh, they told him to come out to us, either give up the Khilafah and we will find somebody new and replace you. Because we can't believe that somebody who's supposed to be in this high of status 
who's supposed to be the Khalifa of the believers, of the Muslims, would say such things in a letter, meaning that they were, they were sneaky. That he wasn't supposed to be sneaky like this in Kanaifin, wal'iyadu billah. Hasha. And Uthman swore to them that he did not write the letter and he did not send his helper or assistant, and they still did not want to believe him. So what did they do? فَاجْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِنْ أَهْلِ مِصْرِ وَالْكُوفَ وَالْبَصْرَةِ And look at what's going on in Misr and Kufa and Basra until today. Do you see what's going on in, the, in those countries? Fitna. Dhul. It's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years because of the problems that they caused a long, long time ago. For those of us who are listening, they're saying, oh, does this mean that Misr never was this? No. But there's always these type of people from these parts of the world that had issues, and they always come back to these issues. Even though they seem times of prosperity and greatness. But it's the type of the people that they are. This is not something that is a generalization. But it exists. So anyways, so they surrounded the palace of the Khilafah or his home, radiallahu anha, For 20 days, they surrounded his home. And one narration said 40 days. So it was long time. They surrounded his house and they told him to give up the Khilafah or come out to us. And one of the, the slaves of Uthman radiallahu anhu wa an Abi Sahla the Mawla Uthman radiallahu anhu قلت لعثمان يوم قاتل يا أمير المؤمنين قال لا والله لا أقاتل قد وعدني رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أمرا فأنا صابر عليه. سبحان الله. His, uh, his, his slave or his servant, he told him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, you have strength, you are the Khalifa. Why don't you fight these people? Why don't you put them in their place? Why don't you teach them a lesson? Why don't you make them obey you by the force if they're not going to listen and not going to be reasonable? And Uthman radiallahu anhu, he said, I will never fight them, I will never kill them. Because the Prophet ﷺ had promised me something like this was going to happen. And he told me to be patient. And I am patient. Ikhwani, look at... When you hear something like this, and your father tells you to do something and to be patient, but when you come down to a difficult, a difficult situation, you're like, I'm sorry, I don't care what my, problem, my father said. Maybe your father could be wrong. It's very fair. But how many of us, the Prophet wasallam, he told us that this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. And he told us to be patient, and he told us all of these different things that we know are prophecies, and are things that will be true, and they will come to pass. But yet, what do we do? We ignore them. Or we pretend like, Oh, the Prophet ﷺ was talking to the Sahaba. Okay, he came with the deen just for the Sahaba, not you. Uthman radiallahu He said, Ya qawm. So Uthman, he came, to, he came out to them and he said, Ya qawm, O oh people. لا تقتلوني فإني وال وأخ مسلم. He said, Don't try to fight me or to kill me. Because they told him, if you don't leave the Khilafah, we will try to kill you or kill you. He said, O oh people, I am a brother, I am a brother in Islam, meaning I have rights that every single Muslim has upon the other Muslim. And he said, Anawalin, meaning I am a Khalifa. I am someone who is a ruler who has a high status, and this is even worse for you to kill the ruler. Because the Prophet wasallam he said, be obedient to the ruler as long as there is a salat that we could pray, and that you don't feel like your deen has been minimized, 
even though if he took your money and he beat your back. حتى لو أخذ مالك وضرب ظهرك. So, to be obedient to the ruler, the just ruler, the ruler who is a true Muslim, is a Khalifa. Not everyone today pops up and says, "Ana Amir al-Mu'minin," and the other one is hiding in a cave and he's Amir al-Mu'minin, and then the other one is hiding on top of the mountain and he has the black, whatever, flag, and he's Amir al-Mu'minin. We have so many people Umara today, but we don't know who's going to follow these. There's too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Are there chiefs and Indians in Islam? It's just a metaphor. Allah is not. You look at me. There are no Indians in Islam. Tayyib. There are, inshallah. Huh? Let's get them sobered up, inshallah. Tayyib. So he said, I am a ruler. I am a ruler. So they would fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, Wallahi, I did not want with this khilafah and me being in this position is to only do good and to forbid evil as much as I could. And this is where the true fitness started. And we said that it would start after the time of Umar. But it did not manifest and show only after the time of the death of Uthman and He said, if you kill me, you will never gather upon the Salat ever. And we've seen that happen. Subhanallah. So when he said, we will not rest until we kill you or fight you. So he made a dua upon them. And what happened is, when Uthman was in his house, وكان عثمان رضي الله عنه في الدار نحو ستة وكان مع عثمان. In Uthman in his house there was about six hundred men. فطلبوا منه الخروج للقتال. So they asked him to come out and fight. He said no. Meaning these men were going to assist Uthman radiallahu anhu and they said, come out and fight these people. And we will fight with you, we will protect you. And he said, no, I will give my soul, myself, so the Muslims don't get into a battle and kill each other over me. The goal is not for me to remain alive. The goal is to not have a fitna or any blood of a Muslim be on my conscience. When's the last time you thought about somebody? That's what we want to ask ourselves. Do we think about other people? Do we think about Islam? Seriously. When we go out and do something that harms Islam, do we think about maybe the 10 or the 100 or the one person that saw me do this will never ever become Muslim because he saw what I did. Or he saw the way I acted or reacted. I know we're all human beings and we make mistakes, but are you consciously thinking about this? This is the question. You're gonna make mistakes and Allah might even make you a reason for somebody not to be a Muslim. But are you conscious when you do this? Are you conscious enough that you say, Oh Allah, I apologize. I ask forgiveness for doing this deed because my goal was not to harm Islam. My goal was not to tarnish your name or the name of the Prophet ﷺ. Just like those who started to, in the protest, burning trees. We talked about this. A brother in front of the embassy in Tunisia with the beard, of course. And the camera's always there when there's somebody with the beard. Alas, I said something wrong. Allahu Akbar. Bismillah. The battery is dead, I think. Iftahad Ahmed, iftahad. This is loud enough, I think. Is it? Yeah, yeah. I'll check. For the women. 
We're already late as it is, so I don't know. Just when you get warmed up. <laughs> I'm not going to be an Arab tonight. <laughs> but literally, if you take this and chew on it, you'll get a little more life out of it. Wallah, you Billah. Are you guys willing to stay a little bit later until 8.30 or not? Yes. 8.30 is good? Yeah. So we can talk about Ali, inshallah. And I think the sisters wanted to have some questions answered so we can do that and not speed through the events. Inshallah. Tomorrow is Sunday, right? Nobody's going to church, alhamdulillah, so it's okay. We can all sleep in. <laughs> we can all sleep in. I tell you something funny so you can all like wake up a little bit and we'll continue. Someone was asked and he said, what would happen if um, a Chinese person, for instance, ran out of a battery? What would he do? What would the Chinese person do if he ran out of a battery? Seriously. He'd just make another one, right? Because everything's made in China. <laughs> All right. What about the European? Or the white man, if you want to call him that. What would he do if he ran out of a battery? No, he would just run out to the store and buy one. But what would the Arab do, and or Muslim maybe, I don't know, I know this, this, was, this was a pun uh, towards the Arabs, and I'm Arab, alhamdulillah, or half at least, so I can say this, all right? No white folks can do this, except if you have Arab in you. They said the Arab would take it and chew on it a little bit, and then put it back, and he said, what kills you is that it actually works. <laughs> what really, 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 that drives you crazy is the battery will probably last longer after you chew on it than it initially did when it came from China. <laughs> if you do, if, please don't try this at home. Don't go chew on any batteries and say that Sheikh Muhammad said if I chew on the battery it's going to last longer. And then you come with a hole in the side of your cheek or something and you want to sue me. I won't be here for you to sue me, inshallah, all right? And I don't have any money. <laughs> huh? it. Allah Musta'an. Well, they have to put uh, an, a fine little notice under it. Don't listen to everything you hear from the, the Mashayikh. Don't try this at home. Tayyib. Uthman radiallahu anhu. He said that I will save, I will give, sacrifice my soul so the Muslims don't battle, don't kill each other. Subhanallah. So they came into, him, in, into the house and they broke the house or the door in and they عنه, was reading the Quran when this happened. This was on the day of Al Eid that they killed Uthman. So Sadaqa when he said, I will be the sacrifice for the Muslims and they killed him on that day and his blood was shattered on over the Quran that he was reading and I believe in another narration he said that he covered his face with his rida with what was on his shoulders so he did not see those who killed him or they did um, did not harm his face and subhanallah ومن حديث مسلم أبي سعيد مولى عثمان بن عفان أن عثمان أعتق عشرين عبدا مملوكا نعم ودعا بسراويل فشد بها عليه ولم يلبسها في جاهلية ولا إسلام وقال إني رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم البارحة في المنام ورأيت أبا بكر وعمر وأنهم قالوا لي اصبر فإنك تفطر عندنا عثمان رضي الله عنه the night before they killed him 
He said that I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr and Umar in my sleep and they and I was wearing a pair of pants and they told me to hold up your pants and tie them tightly and this was a metaphor for being patient that you will have breakfast with us. Subhanallah. And he died and they said that he was between 89 and 99 years old. 89, uh, 89 and 98 years old. Allah And after this, the next Khalifa radiallahu an was Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. And Ali ibn Abi Talib. Radiallahu anhu, he said, Allahumma inni abra'u ilayka min dami Uthman, wa laqad taash aqli yawma qutila Uthman. Radiallahu anhum jami'an. Ali ibn Abi Talib, of course, is not of less caliber than the last three that we've talked about. Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, first of all, was said to be the first person to become Muslim that did not reach the age of puberty and he did not worship anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Quraysh had a hardship when Ali ibn Abi Talib was right around 10 years old or younger and the Prophet Sallallahu this was 10 years before he became a Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How old was he at that time? Uh, you guys are not with me. How old was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he... At 10 years before his Prophethood? 30. The... Now, that he was born 10 years before the Ba'tha of Muhammad Sallallahu before the Prophet Sallallahu became a prophet or received his prophethood. And he was, like I said, the, one of the first people or of the young, uh, the ones who did not reach the age of puberty that accepted the deen of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala in the message of Muhammad Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu if we sit to talk about him, we have volumes and volumes and we'd never get done. But he was noble amongst his people. He was very well known, respected. He was known for having his completeness of thought, not a reactionary, so forth and so on, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he came to his uncle Al-Abbas, who was slightly older than him, his uncle. When Quraysh was having a hardship, and their uncle Abu Talib had a lot of kids. When his uncle had a lot of kids. And he came to Al-Abbas and he said, Ya Abbas, let's go to Abu Talib and relieve him from a couple of his children, make and we would take him under our custody help him relief and relieve him from feeding a couple of his children because there was such a hardship. Al-Abbas said this is a great idea and they took and they went. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَأَخَذَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَلِيًّا فَظَمَّهُ إِلَيْهِ Because they came to their uncle, they said إِنَّا نُرِيدُ أَن نُخَفِّفَ مَنْ عِيَالِكْ حَتَّى يَنْكَشِفَ عَنَ الناس مَا هُمْ فِيهِ فقال لهما أبو طالب إذا تركتما لي عقيلا فاصنعا ما شئتما He said if you leave عقيل for me meaning this is his favorite son عقيل leave him for me and do whatever you want meaning you can take all the rest just leave my favorite son We all have our favorite son or our favorite daughter Please don't let your sons or daughters know that's all huh? Be discreet about it Tell them you love all of them and keep the Favorite one in your heart, inshallah. And this is not because one is better than the other, or one is smarter. 
maybe the one that you love the most is not the smartest or not the nicest. But subhanAllah, there's something about the personality that strikes you that you love so much that you love him a little bit more. SubhanAllah. And you and Yaqub alayhi salam used to love Yusuf alayhi salam more than all of his children. Huh? So coming back. The Prophet ﷺ took Ali and he brought him in and he took care of him and nourished him at a young age. So when he came, he was literally raised with the Prophet ﷺ. So Ali was, extre was extremely loyal to the Prophet ﷺ. He was like a father to him. He was like his cousin, he was his cousin, and he was like a father to him. طيب. The Prophet ﷺ said, When the Prophet ﷺ made brethren between, he took every two and he said, You two are brethren, you two are brethren, you two are brethren, and he said, Ali is my brother. This is the brother you can count on. If you need money, you can talk to him. If you need something, you can go to him. Your brother in Islam can be way better and stronger to you and more helpful to you than your blood brother can ever or will ever be. It's important that we understand this, that we say we love someone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this supersedes the love of blood or fatherhood or whatever. No. Ali radiallahu anh went to all the battles that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to. That he was in. Naam, wa shayid al ghazawat kullaha ma'ada ghazawat tabuq. And the reason why he did not go to Ghazwat Tabuk, the, the battle of Tabuk, is because the Prophet ﷺ told him to stay behind and watch over his family, the family of the Prophet ﷺ. That was the only reason. And then he said, one day he told him, Ya Ali, would you not like to be to me like Harun is to Musa ﷺ? And this is where some who exceedingly lifted Ali radiallahu anhu and put him above his status, they said, oh, Ali radiallahu anhu is just like Harun, he's another prophet. So he has to be the last prophet. And we're not going to get into that tonight, inshallah. No, not at all. Tayyip. أَمَا تَرْضَ أَنْ تَكُونَ مِنِّي بِمَنْزِلَةِ هَارُونَ مِنْ مُوسَى وكان مثلا أو مثالا في الشجاعة والفروسية علي رضي الله عنه never ever back down in a battle and in every single battle even though some of the Muslims ran like in غزوة أحد غزوة حنين these battles علي رضي الله عنه was solid And I tell you a little story, but try not to have your eyes water or sweat because it's hot in here now. The Sahaba said, They said, if the battle got heated, and things went crazy in the battle, we all gave our backs to the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning that he would be covering their backs and he would be protecting them. Not the other way around. Not them protecting him. And when everyone was running away from the, in the battle, the Prophet ﷺ got on a horse and he started screaming, أَنَا النَّبِيُّ لَا كَذِبٌ أَنَا ابْنُ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبٌ I am the Prophet, no lies. I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I told you it was hot in here. So, Ali radiallahu anhu, 
The Prophet Whomsoever loves Ali, he loves me. ومن أحبني فقد أحب الله إن هو ماير لوفز مي لوفز الله ومن أبغض علي فقد أبغضني ومن أبغضني فقد أبغض الله whomsoever detests or hates علي he hates me and whomsoever hates me he hates الله والعياد بالله and the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم made many duas for علي رضي الله عنه because علي was what he was his son-in-law as well. He was married to Fatima radiallahu anha. And Al-Hassan al Hussein, his only grandchildren. Now, so the Prophet ﷺ said, اشتاقت الجنة لثلاث That the Jannah misses. Can you imagine the Jannah missing someone? It's like when you go work for 10, 12, 13 hours, and your wife calls you and she says, I miss you, where are you? I can't stay without you, I need you. Does that ever happen to you guys? Why are you so late? Because I hate rest and I just love to work and kill myself, that's why. Because it's so much fun to be working when everybody else is sleeping. Because it's so much fun to be working when I could be at home resting with you. Huh? Allah <laughs> Remember we talked about the keychain? Or your wife wants you to be a keychain on her hip? And the best thing is if you guys are lucky, your keychain will have an extension on it. So you can go a little bit, but you can never completely leave. That's in the best case scenario. Mm. And Allah forbid you smile to somebody else or say good morning or hello. Oh, you want to marry her too. Tayyib, Allah understand. Ishtaqat al-Jannah. The Jannah misses three people. اشتاقت الجنة إلى ثلاث إلى علي وعمار وبلال that the Jannah misses Ali رضي الله عنه in عمار بن ياسر وبلال رضي الله عنهم جميعا the Jannah misses these people and I give you something listen up sisters since we're talking about the Jannah this is extremely important and I want all of you men to go home and tell your, your wives this too all right because your wife is just as jealous of Hur al-Ain as she is the rest of the women out there. And every time your woman, or your wife, or the sister, she ills her husband, gives him a hard time, makes him feel miserable, makes him feel pain. The Hur al-Ain, his insha'Allah, if he has any in the Jannah, and he will be part of the Hur al-Ain, or the Jannah, the Hur al-Ain will curse you and say, leave him alone. We can't wait until he comes to us. And you have him and you are mistreating him. Subhanallah. Of course, no khatib or shaykh is gonna tell you this. Nobody wants to rock the boat, but my boat's already rocked. Tayyib. Ali radiallahu anhu. The Jannah missed him. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, اشتاقت الجنة إلى ثلاثة أنفار لا إله إلا And the night of the Hijrah, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was going to go to the Hijrah, he told Ali to sleep in his bed because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala told him that by revelation, there are some people who are coming and they want to kill you. And this was the time that Allah gave him permission to make the hijrah. And when he makes the hijrah, and when the Prophet ﷺ made the hijrah, Ali radiallahu anhu, the Prophet ﷺ told him to sleep in his bed and to cover up with his covers. And he told him nothing will happen to you. 
Don't worry about it. And Ali radiallahu anhu probably was not even, I can guarantee he was not worried about dying for the Prophet sallallahu I hope you understand this. But the Prophet sallallahu assured him so that when they walk in on him, he doesn't jump up with his sword or try to fight them or try to kill them or try to do anything. He said, just remain as you are and nothing will happen to you. And do you know how the Prophet sallallahu left the house? And the the people of Quraysh gathered and they said, and they said that one of them mentioned, they said the best way to kill Muhammad والسلام, is to have one person from every tribe, a strong young man from every tribe come and they all kill him as the, killed one, uh, uh, the killing of one man. So his blood will disperse amongst the tribes and then Quraysh would not be able to ask for his blood or to redeem his blood or try to kill someone or, so, or fight with or whatever the case may be. Because even though Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was somebody Quraysh had an issue with or did not like, or did not like his da'wah, if anyone was to t transgress against him, they would be the first ones, they would be the first ones to take revenge for his blood. Because this, this becomes a tribal thing. This was the way of the Arabs back then. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he read the ayah, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said when he walked out, he threw dirt in their faces. They were standing there, they did not see him. And he threw dust or dirt in their face or poured dust on their, on their heads or on their turbans. And he walked out right in front of them. And they did not harm him or see him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Don't worry. <laughs> if you don't stand up for him, if you don't protect him, if you don't honor him, Allah has already protected, honored, and took care of him. So they jumped into the house in the morning because they were used to him leaving at the Fajr. Because he used to pay, pray in secret and he went and he was leaving. So when the morning came, they did not find him. They, they did not see him come out of the house. So one man came to him, them and he said, what are you guys still doing here? They said, we're waiting for Muhammad. They said, are you guys blind? He just walked out not too long ago. He put dust on your head or dirt. And I was looking from far away and I was wondering what is going on. And he left. They said, no way he left. So they broke in the door and they went in and they tried to, when they looked in the bed, they found it was Ali radiallahu anhu. Even at a young age, Ali radiallahu anhu was willing to sacrifice his life for the life of the Prophet Subhanallah. No. And then he told him, Ya Ali, remain in Mecca three nights. Remain in Mecca three nights so that you can give back all the people the money that they have left with me and the belongings. The Prophet ﷺ used to be just like the bank. He was trustworthy. And they knew him. He was trustworthy. They used to call him the trustworthy one. And even though they were fighting him and they wanted to harm him, they had their goods, their money, and they entrusted him with it. Subhanallah. So he told Ali to give everyone back their money or their belongings. Insha'Allah. And when he finished, he caught up to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet sallallahu called Umar, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu, سَمَّهُ بِي أَبِي تُرَاب أو أبو سَمَّهُ بِي أَبِي تُرَاب نعم بِي حرف وجه سَمَّهُ بِي أَبِي تُرَاب The father of dirt 
if we can translate it. Because one day the Prophet Sallallahu came to visit and he came to his house and he said, Ya Fatima, where is Ali? Aina Ali? She said, he is at the masjid. So the Prophet Sallallahu went to visit him or to see him at the masjid and he saw him laying down and his back was on the dirt. They didn't have carpet or anything like that. And when he saw the Prophet ﷺ, he sat up and the Prophet ﷺ started to wipe his back with his hand and he said, Abu Turab, Abu Turab, twice. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, in the battles of Badr, Ali radiallahu anhu was one of the first who went out and challenged the kuffar of Quraysh. And he was one of the, like we said, the ones that never left the battle or never ran off or never ignored a challenge from the non-believers of the kuffar of Quraysh. Now, in the battle of Hunay, in, in the battle of Uhud as well, he was one of the ones that did not fall back and did not retreat in the battle of Uhud. And then in the battle of Hunay, in the, the, uh, naam, in the battle of, let's, before we go there, fi ghazwat al-ahzab. Because al Ahzab, when all of the kuffar and the mushrikun, they surrounded the Medina, and when that's when they built that, when they um, dug the trench, one of the strongest and most feared soldiers of the kuffar, his name was Amr, Ibn Abdi Wad. And he kept on, and he crossed over the trench and he kept on saying, who wants to fight me? I challenge any one of you. Who wants to fight me? Anyone, I will challenge any one of you. And this is what they used to do before. They would send a couple men to start the battle, to challenge. And this usually sways the fight. Whomever really gets killed is usually the one who loses because this instills fear into the opponent. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting in the Sahaba and Ali Radiallahu Anhu said, let me go Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that's Amr. That's the gladiator. Don't go. And then he kept on going back and forth on his horse. Yasul wa yajul bayna al-Muslimin. And he says, man yuqatiluni? Who wants to fight me? This is not something you do to an Arab that has hot blood. <laughs> huh? You guys want to try the battery thing? <laughs> Show us that you have hot blood. And the, he asked the Prophet ﷺ again. The Prophet ﷺ told him no. The Prophet ﷺ was worried that he would be, ki he'd be killed. And at the end, Ali jumped up. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm going to go. That's it. Let me do it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, go. And one of the things that when I was reading this, even though I know the Prophet ﷺ was worried about Ali radiallahu anhu, the goal was not for him to have Ali sit there and have this mushrik go back and forth and challenge the Muslims. Because that would be more detested to the Prophet ﷺ and a burdensome on him than seeing Ali die radiallahu anhu. But he wanted to create this blood boiling position, situation. So when he did actually go out there, he would have a chance at winning. Naam? So Ali radiallahu anhu, he went out there and he killed him. These are all the Muslims sitting in the Medina. Could you imagine none of the Muslims stood up and jumped up and said, I will do it? This is how afraid they were of dying, not dying, but of this, this man. And they knew if one of them died, it was not the issue of dying. It was the issue of this would set the tone of the entire battle. And nobody wanted to put themselves in that position. So that they would be a sabab, a means or a reason for the Muslims to lose a battle. Don't ever think that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were scared of dying. Never. Never think that. 
they used to smell the Jannah. When they were in the battles, they used to smell the Jannah. So, and the Prophet وسلم, he said, Yawma Khaybar, and this is after the Ghazwat al Ahzab, this is when they went to battle the Jews that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Al uh, Khiyana, what's the word? Were they, well, they, um, it was treason, no, there was an act of treason from after they made a, an agreement that they would protect them, they broke that treaty and that agreement and they associated or they met with the Kuffar of Quraysh and they told them that we will be on the back side, you'll be on the front side. If you know for sure this is going to be the end of the Muslims, we will help you. SubhanAllah. <laughs> We'll remember the ayah inshallah ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the Jews as being people that some of them will give you the treaty and say this is our promise, we will do so and then another group from them will come and dishonor the treaty or break the treaty. Subhanallah. Tayyib, let's go back. So Ali on this day as well showed a great deal of courage and he remained surrounding the, the, the entire, uh, the, if you want to call it Khaybar or the, little, the city or the town of Khaybar until they actually surrendered and the doors were open and then they fought them. On the day of Hunayn, on the day of Hunayn, and this was after Fath Mecca, this was after the conquest of Mecca, inshallah ta'ala. We want to finish in about maybe five, six minutes, inshallah ta'ala. On the day of Hunayn, there were 12, over 12,000 Muslims that went to fight this battle. And listen to this. The Prophet sallallahu said, أَيُّ مَا جَيْشٍ فِيهِ اثْنَا عَشَرَ أَلْفْ لَنْ يُهْزَمْ مِنْ قِلَّةِ لَنْ يُهْزَمْ Prophet said, any army that has 12,000 in it will not lose. Not 1.2 million, not 1.2 billion, 12,000. How many Muslims are there today? 1.5 billion? 1.7? Whatever the case may be, it's over 1.2. And it's over 12,000, for sure. Allahu Musta'an. We don't have time. So the Sahaba had, they had a little pride in them. And one of them, uh, some of them were heard talking, said, لَن نُغْلَبَ الْيَوْمَ مِنْ قِلَّةِ That today, we will not lose the battle because of our small numbers. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, any army that has 12,000 in it shall win the battle. So they got a little pride. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنٍ إِذْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ فَلَمْ تُغْنِ عَنْكُمْ شَيْئًا Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, on the day of Hunayn, you got a little proud, but this pride did not help you in anything. وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ ثُمَّ وَلَّيْتُمْ مُدْبِرِينَ and then it seemed like the ground was closing in on you. Meaning that you were starting to fear, starting to see the enemy surrounding you, and you could see yourselves losing. So what did you do? You turned around and you left and you ran. This was on the battle, the day of Hunayn. Out of the 12,000, guess how many people actually remained with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? One people. 100. And eventually that battle turned around. 
as Ali radiallahu anhu and some of the Sahaba, they got on their horses and they started screaming, Ya Ahl al-Quran, Ya Ahl al-Baqarah, Ya Ahl al-Kadha, Ya Ahl al-Kadha. They were screaming, oh, those who memorize the Quran, come on back, those who memorize al-Baqarah, come on back. We can't lose the battle, come on back. The Prophet sallallahu is here fighting, where are you going? And then alhamdulillah, they won the battle. And some scholars, they say first um, battle and second battle, but it was all one battle, alhamdulillah. Now, in many prophecies that were talked about when it comes to Ali radiallahu anhu. Ali radiallahu anhu, and we're going to start talking about the fitna and how he actually was killed as well, radiallahu anhu, was... And if the sisters have those questions, they want to send them up, inshallah ta'ala, we can try to answer them. So we can conclude at 8.30 sharp, inshallah. So that they started to ask Ali radiallahu anhu, they said, you need to find those, the killers of Uthman, and you need to avenge his blood. And Ali radiallahu anhu was not going to do that and it was not of his opinion that this would be a wise decision. Because he said the fitna is still warm and the things, the dust did not settle. This is not a good position to start to do this. The fitna is going to start all over again. And then, naam. So he said if we wait until things settle down and so forth. But... Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, and we say radiallahu anhu, even though there were some mistakes committed at this point, we are not going to speak ill of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu or any of the Sahaba that contradicted the opinion of Ali radiallahu anhu. And Aisha radiallahu anha was one of them. And there was a big misunderstanding at this time. And not to get into that part of the history, because we want to specifically just talk about some of the things that Ali radiallahu anhu did. And he said, radiallahu anhu, he said, when they came what is called Ma'rakat al-Jamal, the fight of the, the camel. وَسُمِّيَتْ بِمَعْرَكَةِ الْجَمَلِ نِسْبَةً لِجَمَلْ عَائِشَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنَّ الَّتِي كَانَتْ تَرْكَبَهُ تَرْكَبُهُ That Aisha رضي الله عنها was on or was mountain or was on a camel and that's why this battle was called the battle of the camel. And they tried to meet with those who had the opinion of Muawiyah and Aisha رضي الله عنهم جميعا and those who came with Ali ibn Abi Talib and they wanted to come to some kind of an agreement and they disagreed. And of course, the disagreement turned into what? Turned into a battle and they started to kill each other. So this battle started between two groups of Muslims. Those who said that Ali radiallahu anha is right and they followed him and those who said that Muawiyah by asking for the blood or to avenge the blood of Uthman radiallahu anhum jami'an is right. So they started to scream back and forth and yell back and forth until they got into a battle. Subhanallah. And Uthman, Ali radiallahu anha one of his Decisions was to take away Muawiyah radiallahu anhu from being one of the representatives in Asham or the part of Syria in, in Palestine and all those are called Asham, were called Bilad al-Sham. كَانَ وَالِيًا عَلَى بِلَادِ الشَّام He tried to or he gave him the order to leave the wilaya or to, to leave the governance. For Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he said no. He refused. And not only did he refuse, he 
refused to give allegiance to Ali radiallahu an. And this is one of the reasons why these issues happened in Ma'arakat al-Jam. And his whole thing was he wanted to get the killers of Uthman radiallahu an. After all of these battles and going back and forth and there's a long history that happened here for shortness of time Ali ibn Abi Talib was kind of put in a very similar situation to Uthman where the fitna became too big and there was a group that said you know what the best thing to do is to do what we're gonna kill Ali and we're going to end this fitna. أعلن فريق من جند علي رفضهم للتحكيم بعد أن أجبروا علي رضي الله عنه على قبوله وخرجوا على طاعاته فعرفوا لذلك باسم الخوارج. This is the beginning of a new group called the Khawarij, those who exited or left. The covenant of the Khalifa and they dishonored him and they disobeyed him. They were followers at first, then Kharaju Ali, they left him or they exited. Kharaja means to exit, to leave. So they left that covenant and they left the obedience of the Khalifa. Ali radiallahu anhu. Imagine someone, a Muslim, who was under the covenant of a Khalifa, and that Khalifa was. Ali radiallahu anhu. And they said, no, no, no. We don't want this. You guys are wrong. Can you imagine this? Subhanallah. And this happened after they had told Ali radiallahu anhu when they were battling with the soldiers of Muawiyah or those, the followers of Muawiyah and they were fighting. The soldiers of Muawiyah, they put the Qur'ans on the top of their swords and they said that the hakam ila al-Qur'an. So they all lifted their swords up and they said, we will make the Qur'an be our judge. Whomsoever is listens to the Qur'an and we come to the conclusion, this is what the conclusion all of us will be happy with and we will follow it. And this was at the point where they realized they are going to lose the battle with Ali radiallahu anhu. And Ali radiallahu anhu, He's been in many battles and he knows the tricks of wars. And he knew that this was just a ruse. This was just a trick. But his followers kept on pushing for this and they said, we will have to. So he listened to them. And after they listened to them and everything kind of stopped and slowed down, they are the same people who came out and they said, you know what, you did not want to do this, you did not want to obey the book of Allah, because when he said, I don't want to listen to them because it's just a trick, they said, oh, just a trick, huh? I think you don't want to follow the rulings of the book of Allah, that's what it is, it's not a trick. Why would you even think like that? Because the heart is not pure. So they said, you know what? We will kill Muawiyah wa Amr ibn al-As and Ali. Ali radiallahu anhu, Muawiyah and Amr ibn al-As. These three, we are going to kill them on the same night. So they gathered some group, they agreed to do this. And then, when they tried to kill them, this group went out to kill these three people, they only end up killing Ali radiallahu anhu. And then the other two, they remained alive. Before Ali radiallahu anhu, after they hit him with the sword and they, he was on the deathbed, they came to him and they said, Ya Rasulullah, they said, Ya Ali, Ya Khalifat Rasulullah, let's gather, or they gathered and they grabbed this person who tried to kill Ali radiallahu anhu, and they said we are going to kill him. 
Now, what would you think Ali radiallahu anhu would do when he's on his deathbed? And this is a grave sin. It's a major, major, major sin to kill, like we talked about earlier. Not only just to kill anyone, but to kill a Khalifa of the believers. And to put the Muslims in peril. And to be problematic for the entire Ummah. What do you think Ali radiallahu anhu would say? I think. Huh? We're going to close at 8.30. Either way, inshallah. And I was talking about the sister's questions. 8.30 we'll pray inshallah. Huh? If they don't have any questions, then we'll, we'll pray sooner. So the brothers can... They can leave, inshallah ta'ala, because their wives are waiting for them. So, istushhida Ali radiallahu anhu. And Ali radiallahu anhu, when he was stabbed with the sword or was stabbed and he was on the deathbed, he said, when they told him we should find him and kill him, he said, in a'ish fa'ana awla bidamihi qisasan aw afwa. Ali radiallahu anhu he said, if I live, I am the one who has priority over taking the qisas from him. Because if you try to kill or you have the intent to kill, it's as if you killed. So what he said is, I have the right to punish him. First of all, as a khalifa, the ruler of the Muslims. And second of all, as the person who it happened to. Or I forgive him. So even Ali radiallahu anhu on this deathbed, he gave the option of possibly forgiving this person who tried to kill him, who had all of the intent to kill him. Radiallahu anhu. in mittu fa'alhiquhu bi. He said, but if I die, have him join me so he can be asked in front of Allah and I will be. The one asking him in front of Allah, why did you kill me? So meaning if I die, then go ahead and kill him for killing someone. فَأَلْحِقُوهُ فَأَلْحِقُوهُ بِي Subhanallah. أُخَاصِمُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا بِي سِوَاهُ And he said, don't kill anyone other than him because of me. Meaning don't go and try to kill his tribe and those who followed him and those who helped him and those who plotted with him. Don't kill anyone else. Let him be the only one. Today you would tell your son, kill them all. The whole tribe, burn it down. And when they asked him in the last breaths, radiallahu anhu, to suggest the Khalifa for them. Radiallahu anhu, he said, you are the ones who will have to take care of this issue and will know better who deserves to be from amongst you. Someone who will rule. And when he passed on, radiallahu anhu, wa he the Muslims gave the bay'ah to his son, Al-Hasan, temporarily. And Al-Hasan radiallahu anhu was the Khalifa for five months. Then Al-Hasan, to not have any bloodshed, no more fighting between Muawiyah radiallahu anhu and between himself, he gave up the Khilafah to Muawiyah. It's not about the Khilafah, dear brothers and sisters. It's not about being in power. It's not about making money. It's not about you being happy or successful. It's about you going to Jannah. It's about you having a goal to go to Jannah. If this means you lose all your money, all your children, all of your pride, if you wait a little bit longer for the Salat, 
whatever that may be. You are there to seek what? The pleasure of Allah so you can go to Jannah. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whomsoever is waiting for the Salat is in a Salat. Man kana yantadiru salah fa huwa fi salah. So the goal of these Sahaba radiallahu anhum to wrap this up to conclude and we did not do the subject justice because of the time restraint or constraint but we wanted to bring out a few things that hopefully the Muslims and all of us including myself can benefit from these positions min hadhi al-mawaqif because ar-rujula ar-rujula to mawaqif manhood are positions taken manhood does not mean because you have a beard and you look like a man and you look tough and rough that you are a man Because how many of us cave under just a little pressure? Somebody asks you a few questions, you go and give all the secrets of the entire ummah, including your mother, your father, everybody. Just don't put me in jail. Just me, save me. Everybody else can go to wherever. Arrujula to mawaqif. Manhood is shown under circumstances and how you react to those circumstances. Can we pick on the sisters a little bit? أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا سبحانك اللهم بحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك. Who wants to make a then come إلى صلاتكم يرحم يرحمكم.